In this episode of Shaping the Future, I am speaking with Gail Bradbrook, environmental activist and co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, as the Autumn Rebellion gains momentum in major cities across the UK. Gail talks about the XR demands for this rebellion and the power of activism for the individual and how that can lead to systemic change at the societal level. We finish discussing the potential for a global citizens' assembly to be held in parallel during next year's UN Climate Conference, COP26, that will be hosted in November in the UK. Thanks for listening. This podcast is available on all major podcasting channels and on YouTube. All the links are on climateseries.com. During the pandemic lockdown, we've seen devastating climate extremes around the world, from Bangladesh floods to California wildfires, hurricanes destroying lives in the US and Asia. All this is set against a backdrop of dire politics. How does Extinction Rebellion connect with the public and contribute to the change we need amongst such chaos? I think that the public's had a massive experience of what a crisis looks like and that our government wasn't ready. Uh, that preparations that could have been made in the UK... I mean, pandemic risk is the number one risk on government lists. Uh, The government wasn't ready. It delayed lockdown. There's actually a study from, I think, Essex uh, Business School showing that this government values lives at only £100,000 compared to a million elsewhere. So, anyway, what the public have seen is that crises are going to happen and so we need to connect by saying the climate crisis is of order a thousand times worse than covid it's horrible making comparisons in some ways but just in terms of the amount of people that are dying and will die um and i think we have connected with the public in the past at the end of the day though we're not here to be liked we're here to get a message across can you talk a bit about what the emphasis is on this rebellion now Our three demands remain, and in particular, we're focused on a climate and ecological emergency bill that Caroline Lucas is going to be tabling. I think she already has the backing of about 20 MPs, so a private uh, member's bill. And uh, that bill contains in it our third demand for a citizens' assembly. It's not an Extinction Rebellion bill, it's a wider coalition. And it shows what actually an emergency response looks like. We're, we're supporting that bill and we're calling for it to be implemented. In the newsletter I've read yesterday from Exa, there's a massive sort of nationwide effort of so many different actions. It seems amazing that people have come out after such a long period of lockdown when there's a lot of fear. Have you been surprised? I've been incredibly grateful to every rebel that's got together in their local group and organised these banner drops. Exxon doctors have been uh, putting stickers on uh, petrol pumps and so on. There's There's been um, a, a big regathering. I, I, I mean, I think that all of us needed to come to terms with... Uh, lockdown and with the new reality of a COVID world and at the same time we've wanted to make sure that the you know COVID is an ecological crisis essentially it's an aspect of what we're dealing with we've wanted to make sure that the climate and ecological wider crisis stays in the public consciousness it hasn't gone away and the environmental movement's been around since the 1970s I mean arguably longer and we're an iteration of that and how long we can carry on for and through our resilience it's down to us all isn't it to look after ourselves and 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 keep going uh but also part of our culture is about resting and, and 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 waves of action so i think that's why i'm not surprised it's happening you talked at the beginning about this government and they seem to have a lot of policies that are not that democratic in many ways and not ecological they're not and you know they seem to be anti what most of us would hope from a government at the moment the climate and ecological emergency is the biggest in my view expression of the failings and insanity of a system that is about domination and control that puts gdp growth above everything else, um, that, that, that says that profit is always a good thing and so on. So that domination system 
has impacts on all sorts of levels and the way it reasserts itself constantly is to divide and control as we know that divide and rule um, especially but not only along lines of race um, so th- th- all, all the issues that are being dealt with you know we talk about an ecological emergency that's coming that's already here if you live in other countries as you mentioned earlier you know it's right in your face it's happening it's killing you uh, if you're a homeless person in this country, the crisis is already here. Society's already melting down. You're not being looked after. So there are multiple crises that unfortunately are only getting worse. And um, what we have to do is work out how to respond to domination in a way that asserts our collective power but doesn't um, mean that we get crushed. One thing I've noticed this year is the impacts have become more visual, more visible in Australia, California, Siberia, mm. you know, these kinds of things. And people are looking for, for ways to take action or to at least voice these things. Mm-hmm. Have you had any evidence of a social or individual tipping point, if you like? Do you think we're getting closer? Do you, it seems like our window of opportunity is closing to really make this change. Um, I mean, it's too late, right? What we have to get our heads around is we're already fucked. It's a mess. And people are already dying and more people are going to die. And it's still worth acting because there are still opportunities to save something of life on Earth. So, you know, and plus we have to adapt to what's coming and we have to repair the damage and minimise the damage. But this idea that there's this kind of, you know clock ticking and it's almost midnight and then we're over it we're already over it right um the the thing that i often say to rebels is to go through the process of grieving and of feeling this thing and you know joanna macy's work is about the work that reconnects is also about gratitude um honouring and loving life on earth so this is doesn't have to be this like fight we're trying to fight this thing and we're going to win and then uh, it's all going to change for the better it's it's a it's a it's a process I at least the way I see it of um, doing what feels right in a way that feels sustainable to people in a way that takes us from a place where we feel small and powerless to a place where we feel together with other people doing what we can and in that way empowered it's supposed to be joyful on the whole of course organizing it has its conflicts and its problems but it, it it's 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 when i say it's transformative it's a, a i think a path of personal development is a path of activism if you also you know well let me use a funny phrase, use purpose-led trauma healing. Look at what comes up for you and go, okay, there's something here. And then take it to whatever practices help you. You know, you need to do both sides of this. You need to be out on the streets and you need to do the work on yourself. And we also need to do the work to reconnect across our communities where we've been divided. You only need a small percentage of people to make change happen. And we've seen this in the wrong side of politics, where some very small groups can cause absolute havoc. Um, do you think that's a, a call for, for people who are considering joining Exile or, you know, taking part? That's a, a good reason why they should, because they might just be that sort of, that person. That... On the one hand, it's really useful to have data and research, and, you know, I have a science background, I'm really into that. And on the other, there's this bigger mystery unfolding in the universe. You just consider that there's, like, billions of galaxies, and God knows what that's all about. The You know, the science of consciousness, it's it literally mind-blowing. Um, and And... So what some of the data says is that, you know, it's Erica Chenna with Maria Stefan's data about, you know, just requiring 3.4% of the population or less to be in active participation in a social movement. It also needs those 60%, I think 50-60% public support as well. Not necessarily for that social movement, but for, um, for the issue itself. Yes, it is a small percentage of active people. You know, the civil rights movement, at its height, was only 
one percent of the population um and uh that had a a massive a massive impact and so when people take action the ripples of the change how you impact other people is is really huge so it you think that you know um an article in the guardian talking about you know a protest great it, it's getting the message out there but when you take action as a person it says so much to your friends and family because they know you they're like well oh, why is tom doing that you know uh and people need to also be well aware that you can participate in extinction rebellion without getting arrested it's just so much work to be done that's you know behind the scenes helping and supporting or funding us or whatever so it's not a requirement to to be on that side of the law breaking what opposition do you get it must be quite strong from certain quarters yeah you know gandhi said uh, first they ignore you then they laugh at you then they attack you then you win so you know of course um uh, if you stand by the side of the road with a placard, there's lots of ignoring goes off. The the laugh at you bit was, uh, oh, you're all hypocrites. Or, you know, if, 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 if my, you know, my friend Donica, who a, leads a super green lifestyle, then he gets laughed at for wanting us all back in the cave. You know, you can't win with, with, with those sorts of focuses on individuals. Or, you know, you get told that you're um, dirty protesters who need to get a job and a bath. Or you're middle class and privileged, you know, or it's the politics of M because you've got no money or, you know, you're champagne socialist. So whatever you are, you're sort of fucked, aren't you? Um, and, and, and this time uh, it seems to be uh, the focus is on that we're taking risks with, with COVID. Not true, not in the science, actually. I mean, both the Black Lives Matter protests were um, looked at, there were no spikes, and then there's modelling from Columbia University, protests that social distance and so on are outside, um, n- not risky. And meanwhile, you've got the government enc- encouraging people back into offices, aeroplanes are flying with people on them you know what nonsense to to focus it's a politically motivated comment right to say we're creating any risks around covid the other one is um hammering us on facts and any particular piece of uh data that we might have used so if you use a report and then that report becomes questioned that's the process of science right that's how it works so you might quote this thing and then somebody says ah oh, you know it may, we, we 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 dispute that and then you might think well maybe i shouldn't use that fact anymore um or that 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 piece of information and then they're like oh you know you've got your facts wrong you know i like, know we're just trying to say that we have to operate from the precautionary principle which is there is a risk that for example the carbon that's already in the atmosphere is going to lead to five degrees of warming 20 institutions supercomputer modeling however there's new science saying well maybe that's not as bad as we thought so the debate carries on the point is these are massive massive risks and so um if you want to take us to one side and argue about the science we'll just get two scientists on don't get activists who are just you know trying to uh, wade through different bits of data with cop 26 being held in the uk next year there's going to be a lot of emphasis in the next 12 months or so plus on britain i think and and exiles certainly a very visual element of the climate movement do you see that as a as a kind of a milestone especially for speaking to the public Anything that puts this agenda in the public eye is is to be welcomed and um, I guess used as some kind of opportunity. I mean, the COP26, right? <laughs> it's been going on a long time. Uh, we're not holding our breath that it would be successful. It's in a country that considers a, something to be a green bailout that's three billion that's essentially just reversing some of the awful policy, and not fully reversing them, by the way, awful policy decisions of the past while spending 100 billion on an aviation shuttle service called HS2, I think 27 billion on roads development. So this country has zero credibility uh, as, a, as a so called climate leader. In fact, we're something like two to three, a factor of two to three out, according to um, Kevin Anderson uh, in, in Manchester, who's a climate scientist. So, But yes, we, we, we will uh, look to cop and other opportunities to, to keep this agenda alive. But what we're really focused on is uh, citizens' assemblies where 
people cannot be influenced by or less likely to be influenced by the lobbyists, those that have got vested interests that seem to get on the TV all the time without, you know, revealing their funding sources. A global citizens' assembly has been uh, designed. There's been some grassroots to global work already with uh, colleagues in the global south um, to look at how you can, you know, even calling it citizens' assemblies are slightly problematic because not everybody's a registered citizen in their country for, for different reasons. So um, how to make it as inclusive as possible. But, you know, imagine a global citizens' assembly, um, the diversity that would be in that room. What, a, what an incredible thing. So we're actively... Uh, we've seeded a piece of work that's outside of XR now with experts and trying to get that together. So. Fabulous. Thank you very much. It's been great to talk to you.